Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome and thanks for logging on. We are waking up with watches and everything is for sale. Reach out to me directly. I am tmasso at thewatchbox.com for pricing regarding any of these watches. Also, we buy what we sell. We sell what we buy. Trade us a watch or sell us a watch. Sell us an entire collection. We pay cash. We pay fast. We wire direct. We make it easy and there's no upper limit on value paid. We will buy your entire vintage Rolex Daytona collection. To buy, trade, or sell, reach out to tmasso also at thewatchbox.com for pricing and details. Okay, jumping straight in, here's a 2023 launch from Rolex. Rolex making a lot of noise in the last 48 hours concerning its new retailer arrangement. It owns Bucherer, that's the news. Today, we're talking about a watch that's new for 23 because it's the first of the 126 generation of the GMT Master II to feature this yellow gold combo with the combination of ghosted and black bezel. If you look carefully, get closer here, you can see that we have two different shades of Cerachrome. One is a tribute to the shadow or the ghost or the fade that you often see on aging black GMT Master bezels, and then the other is a conventional black Cerachrome ceramic. Still, 40 millimeters in diameter, we'll throw it on my wrist, you can see it's on the historic Jubilee bracelet, which more often than not has been an option on the GMT throughout its history. And it's a lovely watch, it wears easily, it's under 50 millimeters, even end link to end link, so it fits snug. It's remarkably solid, solid links, thick gauge clasp, solid gold case back. Rolex gold watches feel like the platinum watches from other brands. Of course, two time zones, three can be read temporarily. Chronometer certified, tested by Rolex to no worse than minus two plus two seconds per day. With a 72 hour power reserve, we'll demonstrate how some of the functions work right here. You have the ability to activate hacking or stop seconds. Now everything moves in sync. The intermediate position for the crown moves the local hour hand. You can jump the date forward or backwards depending on which direction you're traveling. The bezel is bi-directional and assuming you nail the GMT offset of whatever time zone you set on the 24 hour hand, you can use this to calculate three time zones simultaneously. Typically the way that works is you have your local time, you have your Greenwich mean time on the 24 hour hand, and then you use the bezel either left or right, depending on whether we are GMT plus or GMT minus in the destination time zone, because this is traditionally a pilot's watch. So we'd use that bezel to calculate destination time. Now it does have Rolex's lovely chromolite blue lumen. You can see all four hands are luminescent. And I do enjoy that ghost or shadow bezel fade. It's a lovely homage without being explicitly retro. And people sometimes complain about solid case backs on Rolex watches. I like it. It adds more weight, heft, makes for a thinner watch. And frankly, Rolex movements are not designed to be seen. They're not bad looking. They're just not artisanal. Here we have a watch that's somewhere between artisanal and series production, because this is probably the most exotic modern constellation I've seen. Launched in 2015 in 352 pieces. This is the Platinum Constellation Globemaster. Now, every year, Omega comes out with a small number of exotic watches, usually in precious metals, and this Platinum No-Date Globemaster is one of them. 39 millimeters, both bezel and case, are platinum here. It's a 39 millimeter diameter. It's only 46.5 lug tip to lug tip and about 13.3 millimeters thick. The dial is also made of platinum. Let me get the seconds hand out of the way so you can see that more easily. But just like the media blasted platinum dial of the Rolex Yacht Master through the years, here we have a dial that's also a bit like the gray side of the moon. You can see it's a media blasted constellation pie pan design as the globe master really marks the rebirth of the pie pan. And you can see it says PT950 right under the marquee. We have the vintage globe master script, all hands as well as indices and the Omega logo or white gold. And you can see they have beautiful lustrous blue enamel on top. The watch is surprisingly 100 meters water resistant. And on the reverse side, we have a little white gold disc featuring a smoked enamel fade applied by hand, reminding you that the original 1952 constellation was an observatory chronometer. Hence, we have the observatory with the stars on that enameled piece of white gold, and then we have the signature star on the dial. Now, this is a master chronometer, so designed to run to exacting standards, not just COSC and beyond, but also winding efficiency, power reserve, water resistance, shock resistance, over 15,000 gauss anti-magnetic, and with a full balance bridge and a free spring, balance very shock tolerant, so anti-magnetic, 100 meters water resistant, 
and then also shock tolerant. We have the rotor as well as the balance bridge crafted of 18 karat solid gold, twin mainspring barrels in series, 60 hour power reserve. We have a coaxial escapement. We have a system that allows you to move the hour hand independently. There's also a stop seconds function. We have a strap that features platinum infused threading, truly special and exclusive to these platinum special omegas. It's not enough for an omega to be platinum. It has to be one of these special editions each year to include the matching platinum thread, and this features a matching platinum clasp. It's not as big as it looks. Remember, the annual calendar, if you've seen the Globemaster annual calendar, that's a much bigger watch. At 39 millimeters, this is hand handsome and wearable on a broad range of wrists. And you can see it's really not large at all. The edges of the lugs are nowhere near the edge of my wrist and it's flat enough to fit underneath the cuff. The only drawback here is if you want a date, you don't get one. And if you want loom, it doesn't have it. But this watch with a retail price of $43,900 sells pre-owned for about half that. An incredible opportunity for an Omega man who has it all. Now let's jump into something that's even more exclusive. There are 352 of those Connies in the world, but Debitune makes fewer than 300 watches per year. This is the first generation of the DB27 Titan Hawk. Came out in 2012, it was made through 2017. Like the Titan Hawk V2, the V1 has a 43 millimeter grade five titanium case and variable geometry ergonomic floating lugs. Now what sets this one apart from the V2 is the V2 has a center seconds hand. This has a little deltoid indicator for the date. So it's a radial date. And then we also have an automatic movement with triple parachute shock protection and two barrels and a six day power reserve. The DB27 V2 has a 60 hour power reserve. So this is a more sophisticated movement. Now you can see there's a lot of fingerprints on the case back here. So I forgive me that, but we do have a little bit of marks from wear over the years. I always like to make sure I give you full disclosure with a pre-owned watch. There is a quick set for the date. Remember this can always be polished off when it goes back to service at Debitune in the future. Debitune makes its own cases, dials, and movements to control quality, but also to ensure they can do really small runs, like three, four, five examples of a given dial per year. Here we have a lovely dished blue dial with silver printing. You can see inboard we have the concentric micro light engraving that's distinctive of Debitune. And this is the compact lug profile. The lugs are roughly 51.5 millimeters. They go down to 47.5 when you compress them. And you can see on the wrist, it really is quite thin. It's, it's only a little bit over 12 millimeters thick, very compact, easy to wear. I have no issues on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. Very comfortable. There are those, however, who prefer traditional case sizes. No matter how well those floating lugs adapt the watch to the wrist, a lot of folks are just going to be more comfortable with a smaller watch. So this is a 2023 release from H. Moser & C. It is the Pioneer Tourbillon 40 millimeters. It has an Arctic blue Fumé fade dial, and then we have plenty of luminescence. As you can see, the watch has a screw-down crown. It's part of the Pioneer Sports Watch line. 120 meters water resistance, just over 47 millimeters from lug to lug. Now I'm going to throw it on the wrist and it wears easily. Super comfortable. You can also see the lugs are angled down so it arcs around the edge of the wrist. I could recommend this watch for a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference. As you can see, the lugs come nowhere near the edge. It'll fit under a sleeve with consummate ease. Even though it is more of a sports watch, it's compact enough to be used as a dress watch. Taking a look at some of the details, you can see that the Fumé fade on this dial includes Moser's new transparent lacquer logo. So Moser strong on design, but not big on branding. It's decided that the watches are distinctive enough. They don't need to be overtly branded. Hence, they're going to be going with this transparent varnish logo on all their watches moving forward. We also have a flying tourbillon. No upper bridge to block your view. One minute tourbillon. It is a double hairspring, which means that you have one hairspring opposing it, 180 degrees out of phase, an identical flat hairspring. The idea being, in any physical position, when you turn the watch, one hairspring will cause the watch to run fast, and the other, by an equal and opposite margin, will cause it to slow down, instantaneously correcting the effect of gravity, and thus making this the rare tourbillon on a wristwatch that actually is there for the sake of chronometry. And you can see that the tourbillon components here are the best finished element of the movement. The movement's nicely done, but the most obvious hand finish is on the tourbillon. And again, no upper bridge to block your view.
Flipping it over, you can see it's based on the HMC200 automatic, which is a bi-directional magic lever style winding system with ceramic bearings, 72 hour power reserve, a nod to Moser pocket watch making from the 19th century. The barrel arbor is set in a golden chiton cup held by black polished screws. We have Moser's distinctive double crested Cote de Genève. And then you can see the base of the tourbillon sits on a ball bearing system with ceramic bearings for better bracing. You can see how broad that base is. It's not a jeweled staff by any means. We have satination on the wheels, the crown wheel, the crown wheel core, and there's a mostly mechanically applied but handsomely done and neatly done bevel with a rose gold rotor that features three different types of finish and it features a media blasted crown with recesses that include coined case flanks, a lovely vulcanized rubber and vented Moser factory strap, and of course Moser buckles match the case. You can see how the recesses of the case match the design of the buckle itself. This is a fan favorite, and I am the fan in this case. I love the Devon treads, and I'm actually working with them right now on some exciting things going forward. Self-selected, you might ask, why am I working with Devon? Well, we don't own them. We have no financial interest in them, and they haven't given me anything for free. But I've always dug the watches, the scrappy people behind the company, the sense of innovation, willingness to dare, and frankly, the way the watches work is just super cool. Now, this example right here is the Tread 2 Murder. It came out back in 2013. It was one of the original Tread 2 models, and they went with a more wearable tonneau case compared to the tread one so it's 41.5 millimeters across not including the crown and the lever and then it's 55.9 millimeters lug to lug but it wears really compact this one's DLC steel and you can see it fits nicely it's a big watch and that is the idea but and I'll zoom out a little bit more so you guys get a better sense of this one in proportion. The Tread 2, according to founder Scott Devon, really is the all-the-time watch. And you can see that this watch is more wearable than the enormous Tread 1, which I'll bring on in a second just for comparison. What's also fascinating here is that the belt drive system, via the addition of a second control, this has got a button and a lever, the belt drive system can be used as a chronograph, which is what you're looking at right now. So you can see that we have the two belts. They're made of fiberglass reinforced nylon. And this is in chronograph mode. We've got two motors, two belts. We've got optical sensors to make sure that the indices always line up perfectly inside their frames. And you can see how each index on the belt lines up perfectly with the triangular pointer. And this is done using that optical system. So there's a sensor that knows where the belt is. And so it will always be bang spot on. Thermocompensated, accurate to 15, generally 10 seconds a month. Lithium ion battery in Inductively charged, you can see, of course, a tribute to a famous film. And then the watch is also quite scratch resistant. I'm not going to say it's indelible, but the DLC on these has proven to be pretty durable. It's got about a 14 day power reserve if you run it without the constant seconds, and it'll last about seven if you run chronograph mode full time or you run the constant seconds. Now, the way this works is we have our seconds belt and we have our minutes belt when in chronograph mode. And so, because the hour belt is used for the minutes, this only time intervals up to 12 minutes, but I find that I generally time short intervals when I'm using chronographs. Okay. Now we're back to time telling mode. That's how you activate constant seconds. And now the belt goes into minutes mode, just like that. A lot of fun. One of the coolest watches ever made in the United States and significantly still made in the United States. If you need service on these, generally it's one to two weeks and you can actually call the factory and talk to a guy. His name is Daryl. One of the reasons why I love this brand. Go ahead, try that with JLC or Omega. I promised you a comparison to the Tread 1. Well, here it is right there. You can see the relative size of the two. Jason Wilbur's Tread 1 still remains one of the coolest watch designs of the 21st century. But as you can see, big as it is, it's not for everyone. The Tread 2 is a lot more bearable. And yet, in spite of that, I really want the Tread 1. <laughs> Okay, much more traditional now. I understand the Devons are not for everyone. We have here the Breguet 7057. So the original tradition 
7027 from 2005. That was a 37 millimeter watch. This is 40. So in white gold, we have a bigger presence on the wrist. You can see fundamentally the movement itself has not changed a lot. It still includes the elements we love from the original. A dial designed after a historic Breguet pocket watch. Power reserve indicator up in the corner. We've got a dial made of solid gold cut on a rose lay and then a straight line engine to create the lovely guilloche. We have the wheels that are designed like a pocket watch. You can see that splayed tapered spoke design. We have the barrel given pride of place at the very center. And then we have a surprisingly modern balance assembly. You can see that it's free sprung for durability and precise adjustments. And the balance features recessed bolts for variable inertia adjustments, yes, but also for reduced aerodynamic drag. And then we have a Breguet overcoil hairspring, so the watch keeps excellent time in every position on the wrist. And then a Breguet steel parachute spring that's actually been blued and hand finished and despite being a very traditional looking watch it does feature hacking or stop seconds you can see the power reserve indicator up in the corner power reserve is 50 hours flip it all over you can see the movements gorgeous on the reverse side engraved satinated because there would not have been Cote de Genève in the era of Breguet you could see adjusted in five positions the high horology and chronometer standard you could see the underlying mechanism that underpins the power reserve indicator. So we also have a case back power reserve indicator. And you can see well that even though the frosted finish dominates, we do have traditional mirrored anglage, modern day quality anglage on the edge of the bridges. So you will not be short of the fine finish we have with black polished and fired blued screws. And of course, fired blued steel Breguet style hands. The lugs are welded on, a very expensive and old school artisanal way of making a case. And then the coining of the case is cold rolled. The watch case is put in a jig and it's then hand finished to remove any impurities or imperfections. These are excruciatingly handmade watches and hand finished watches. And I've long wondered why Breguet doesn't get the recognition for the quality of the watches it makes. And my only conclusion, the only thing I can think of is that if you were a minor league baseball player, with the name Babe Ruth, you could be the top rated prospect in baseball. And when you come up to the major leagues, they're not gonna be judging you on your own terms or letting you create your own legacy. You're gonna be judged against the greatest baseball player who's ever lived. And Abraham Louis Breguet was the greatest watchmaker who ever lived. It's difficult for a brand named after him, even 200 years after his death, to identify and define itself on terms other than the company after Breguet died. Just like it would be tough for a kid named Babe Ruth, no matter how many all-star games, silver sluggers, or MVPs he wins, he'd never be able to create his own legacy. Breguet has that same type of trouble. But if you're the type of watch buyer who focuses on quality alone, this is gonna be the best value in watches. I would say better than almost all of the hip independence of our moment. And, I should mention, finished to a degree that even your average Calatrava or Patrimony is not a real opportunity with Breguet, if you can get over the fact that the name is Breguet. Here's a watch that represents the best of 1990s IWC design. After the early 90s, Jubilee Portuguesers brought the famed Portuguese back into the collection on a permanent basis. There was an understanding that a 43 millimeter dress watch in the 90s was as aberrant as a 43 millimeter dress watch was during the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. So the idea of a smaller Portuguese preserving the lines and the dial of the original was hatched in Schaffhausen in 1996. Reference 3531 was born. This is the 353103, the Kleine Portuguese, and it is exactly what its name implies. So the watch, being super compact, is only 35 millimeters in diameter, though I feel it's a little bit more like a 36. You can see just over 8 millimeters thick with that lovely 1990s IWC fish crown. I believe most of these were made between 96 and 99. This one was sold in 2001, so it gives you a frame of reference for the time period. And this is pre georges Kern International Watch Co. design. Super elegant. It hasn't aged a day. And it's a Portugueser for the if only it were smaller crowd. Because, well, it is. You can see on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, it wears like a traditional Calatrava. And it really is so compact, being just over 42 millimeters lug to lug, that a wrist of any size, no matter how small can wear it well. And there's a surprise on the case back. Back in the 90s, 
IWC and JLC were owned by the same German company. To be fair, 60% of JLC was owned by that company, 40% was owned by AP. Now, JLC provided its sister company, IWC, with the caliber 899 and 889 and their derivatives. So here we have the 891. It's a bi-directional automatic winder. You know that because you can see JLC's famed jeweled reversing rocker right there. 40-hour power reserve, 4 hertz beat rate, 5 position adjustment, 36 joules. The watch does feature a hacking or stop seconds function and a Triovis micro adjustment mechanism. These movements are incredibly thin, fine, beautiful, and accurate timekeepers. And the idea of getting a JLC movement in an IWC is a whole lot more appealing than the 2000s and 2010s notion of getting, say, a Salida movement in an IWC. This is cooler. And the watch is universally wearable with a nice traditional IWC pin buckle. The Kleine Portugieser, a really fun, somewhat obscure, and undeniably desirable hybrid of IWC style and JLC engineering. A lot of folks ask me, Tim, what's your favorite Zenith? And of course it's an El Primero, but it's a specific type of El Primero. It's the El Primero Chronomaster with the caliber 410. This movement was born alongside the other El Primero back in 1969, the first automatic integrated high beat chronograph. And well, in the initial iteration, we had a version called the 3019 PHF. It was a full calendar moon face. Later on, it would become the caliber 410, and that's exactly what we have right here. A 40 millimeter rose gold case. This design was launched in 1994, and even through the late 1990s, it remained the flagship of the collection. The chronomasters were chronometer certified, beautifully appointed, and in this case, wonderfully wearable. Caliber 410 is the triple calendar with moon face. You can see a lovely guilloche dial with the tachymeter on the dial, like an old mid-century chrono. Faceted, dauphine style hands. We have rosette patterns in each of the subdials. We have the day, we have the date, we have the month. There's a quick set for the date and the month. Note, COSC certified Swiss chronometer, and unlike the chronometer certified Zenith powered Rolex Daytonas, this one has the full fat 5 hertz 10 beat per second movement. You can see how smooth that chronograph sweep is. Flip it all over, you can see the 1990 style Zenith store logo on the crown. You can also see it on the buckle turn it all over completely, and you can see here that we've got a serial number on the rotor to remind you this is a chronometer certified movement. In order to get a chronometer certification, a movement has to have a seconds hand and a serial number. Both conditions matched. Here you can also see caliber 410 is part of the reference. That's always the case on modern Zenith watches. Nicely decorated like JLC with a mix of mechanical and hand finish. You can see it's beaten away at 36,000 vibrations per hour. It has a automatic winding 50 hour power reserve. It does not have hacking because that's not a traditional El Primero feature, but it does have a quick set. You can see it has a column wheel and a lateral clutch. The preferred combination for horological connoisseurs who love the beauty of a lateral clutch and the crispness of a column wheel. Wearing it on the wrist, the 40 millimeter case size is ideal. It's only 13.3 millimeters thick, sits super low, very comfortable, and a watch that frankly, even a woman could wear as it's relatively short across the wrist. Triple calendar, El Primero, chronometer, and rare. Today, the Chronomaster no longer denotes a watch that's universally chronometer certified, but back in the 90s, as you can see here, there were no exceptions. Finally, we end with a real landmark, a watch that defined innovation in its day. And you could go back to the days of Nicholas Riasek. There are a few sea changes in the design of the chronograph watch, quite like the 2004 Alang Unzona double split, technically part of the Saxonia family. It's like the linebacker version of a datograph. Now what it's got here is a 43.2 millimeter platinum case. This model was made from 2004 to 2010 when it was discontinued. The dial is a solid blank of silver that's been cut blackened and then garnished with white gold hands as well as indices and Roman numerals. You can see that we have split seconds because one second's hand has been arrested, but you can see we also have split minutes. That's what makes the double split special. You can split two events up to 30 minutes in duration and you can tell the number of minutes and seconds disparity between the two. Now what's cool here is that the watch also operates as a traditional flyback chronograph so you can reset and restart without first stopping the watch. We do have hacking or stop seconds. There's a little power reserve indicator up at the top of the dial. 
It is a manual wind watch. It has a 36 to 38 hour power reserve. You can see there's actually a surprising amount of luminescence here for a dress watch. And being a dress watch with a little bit of a vintage vibe to it, we do have a dial side tachymeter scale outboard for gauging speed. On the reverse, we have the Caliber L0011. It's a monster. You can see we have two column wheels, one, two. The primary column wheel activates the primary clutch to engage and disengage. We then have a second column wheel and little pincers to release and seize the chronograph seconds wheel. So you can see we have two black polished column wheels. And by the way, everything that's turning black as I tilt the watch is mirror polished steel. That second column wheel, like the primary, has world-class feel and sound. You can see that the balance cock, though buried, has been freehand engraved, and we've got a free-sprung balance with an overcoil hairspring adjusted in five positions. There's a decoupling system, so when you do stop the chronograph retropont hand, it doesn't drag and slow down the rest of the watch. This decoupling system is rarely used and only on the best chronographs. Think premier Patek lateral clutch chronos and longa. You can also see the depth of this movement. Blue, violet, gold, silver, all in one. A panoply of colors, textures, tones, shapes, and changes of planes. It feels like you're peering through the canopy of a jungle, and it is a jungle of fine finish. German silver bridges and plates, steel, chronograph components, both polished and blued screws, and of course pivot jewels set in golden chaton cups in homage to vintage German pocket watch making of the 19th and early 20th century. The double split, one of the most consequential and innovative chronographs of all time. I can wear it on my wrist of 16 centimeters circumference, though I do believe that if your wrist is any smaller than mine, you're going to find that there are some fit issues. I think 16 is a great size. Anything bigger, it's gonna look fantastic. That is the double split. Guys, if you love what you see here, reach out to me, tmasso at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details.